paints this picture of people lost in a desert. What a picture of hopelessness and helplessness that is. And that's unfortunately where many people are right now. And this whole pandemic that we've been through has just uh, exaggerated that experience in their life. Well, the psalmist paints another picture, and this one is the picture of prison. He said sometimes life can be like prison. The desert may have seemed an odd subject for a painting, but verse 10 offers one even less likely. It's a group portrait of prisoners. Psalm 107 verse 10 says, Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, Leonard Griffith has written that people are like prisoners trapped in the dungeon of their own moral folly, the victims of evil rather than the doers of it. They started out with freedom of choice, but they continue to choose the wrong thing. But that freedom will be fleeting when we choose evil. The wrong choices become patterns of behavior that finally master those who made the choices. Griffith continues, he says the drug addict would give anything to be set free from the chains of his habit, but it has him hooked and he knows that the end of it will be his death. In his sober moments, the alcoholic hates himself for the hell that he creates in his own home, but his bottle is like a chain and he knows that he cannot break loose from it. Not all prisons are of our own making, however. Some of us are trapped by difficult circumstances from which there seems little hope or escape. These prisons might have been constructed by other people's evil, by persecution or by matters over which we don't have any control. We don't have to be at fault to become hopeless captives. The psalmist says that sometimes life can be like a desert, the dryness and barrenness of it all. Sometimes it's, it's like being in prison. You're caught up in the chains of your own making. And here's one many of us know. He, 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 he paints the third picture. He says, sometimes life can be like a hospital. We come to the portrayal of a familiar and forbidding setting. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. This is a ward of illness and affliction, and it serves as a corridor that opens into the darkness of death. Now, not every illness, of course, is caused by sin. But the people here have poisoned themselves with their own transgressions here in the Psalms. And there they are in the ward. They lie there waiting only for their final moments on this earth. So the first three paintings are easily described. Sometimes life is like being in a desert where there's no water, where you're parched and you're thirsty. Sometimes life can be like being in a prison. Sometimes it's like being in the hospital. These three pictures are easily described, and we can dispense with them in the few words to which uh, we have uh, given. It is the fourth picture that is very meaningful for all of us now. It's the picture about which Michael was singing a few moments ago. It's the picture of the storm. The picture causes us to catch our breath. We're gazing at the portrait of a furious storm. Here are the verses from Psalm 107, verse 23 and following. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths, their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. They are at their wit's end. And then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so that its waves are still, and then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. How many disasters like COVID-19 have felt like a raging storm? 
That's why this psalm is so meaningful, because when we go through these storms, here is God's Word helping us to understand the storm and understand where He is in the midst of it. So let me just unpack this for us in this message. First of all, I want you to notice the place of the storm. When I've encountered the storms in my life, I've taken encouragement from this psalm. It has always been when I have ventured out into the open sea, when I have taken a great step of faith and moved beyond the borders of safety, that I've been caught by the treacherous winds. Here's what he says, they who go down to to the sea, who do business in great waters, I feel certain that I'm pursuing the will of God for my life, but my faith is tested by the wind and the rain. Have you ever been there? As far as you know, you aren't out of the will of God. You're doing everything God asks you to do. You're even walking in faith. You've taken a big step to trust Him for something important. And then all of a sudden, the storms come. The message is simply that great works are done in deep waters. Many of us never learned that lesson. We want to hang around in the shallow part of the pool. And we do that because we're afraid. We don't want to get out of our comfort zone where we, where we will feel, feel fear. But Jesus tells us to launch out into the deep and take risks in the pursuit of excellence and in the knowledge of God. We walk to the edge of all of our light, and that next step into the blackness holds the destiny God has for us. But it also holds whatever dangers are out there. We know that. We we realize the risk, and perhaps we'll never take that one terrifying step that makes the miracle possible. It's not simply biblical sense. I mean, this is common sense. I I read this not just in the Bible. I read it in business books. If you're in the business world, you realize if you play it safe, and you'll never build a business. Launching a new firm is launching out into the deep. Some of you are right there now. You've lost your businesses, and you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not going to try this again. I'm going to take the easy way out. I'm going to just fold my tent and quit. And maybe God doesn't have that in your plan. Maybe God wants you to rebuild. Maybe he wants you to take that step into the unknown. The storms are certain to come if you do it, and the winds will howl. You'll be out on the edge all by yourself and unsteady, but your business will fail despite all of your best efforts if you don't go where God calls you. You'll never know what God wants to do unless you get out into the deep. No one ever said it would be easy in the deep waters. I mean, all of us who are leaders in the church, we know the difference. We take faith steps. The world calls it risks. We build buildings when we don't have enough money uh, to pay for them uh, when they're done, and God supplies it. Oh, the stories we could tell of what God does for us when we step out by faith into the deep waters. And oh, the sadness and sorrow as we watch people who just hang on to the shore only doing what they can themselves understand to do. They stay along the shore, and as they stay along the shore, they discover that they're safe, safe from drowning, safe from disaster, but they never will know the blessings of the deep things of God. The place of the storm, where is it? It's in the deep waters. That's where the wind blows. That's where the challenge is. Now, here's something that's really surprising, and you may— This is sort of counterintuitive if you want to know the truth. Let me talk to you about the producer of this storm. Where's the storm come from? Well, what's wrong with this passage is that it's very unusual. It seems backwards. Psalm 107, verse 25. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. And the pronoun here is he, capitalized. And we realize that this storm is is created and produced by Almighty God Himself. As great as the power of the wind and the waves may be, there is something, someone more powerful in the background. Behind it all, it is God. Now, listen to me. We're much more comfortable crediting God with calming storms than causing them. And yet, we have to take the Scripture at its word. Here in Psalm 107, it teaches us that the Lord is the one who produces this storm. His purposes are at stake. Let's take care before blaming God for every storm. I mean, that may be a dangerous thing to do. But sometimes we've done just fine on our own bringing on those dark clouds, and we make the mistakes, and 
God's place is simply to let us discover how deeply we need him when we're just about to go under the waves. So we're not referring to those self-induced storms. We're talking about storms brought on expressly by divine intention. Did you know that sometimes God puts you in the middle of the storm? He has done that for so many of us during these days. Here we are. This is not man called. We didn't do this. We didn't ask for this. We didn't pray for this. This is what's happened. We're in the midst of this storm. Have you ever been through fire and water in your problems? Why did he send that storm into your life? If you're weathering a storm, you can be certain the winds are no random weather front. They blow for a clear purpose. And as you're caught up in the tempest, you need to ask God to help you be caught up in his purposes. The place of the storm is the deep waters. And the producer of the storm is God himself. Now notice the peril of the storm. What an image God paints on the canvas of Scripture in Psalm 107. Here's verses 26 and 27. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro. They stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. This is a riot of mixed metaphors in the service of a strong point. This is a passage that is spinning wildly out of control. Have you ever lost control of an automobile on an icy highway? If so, you know this feeling well. These passengers of the rocking ship are at their wit's end. By the way, did you know where that expression, at your wit's end, came from? It came from right here in the Bible. These people have been outwitted. They've come to the end of all their ideas and strategies. The tempest has mastered their vessel. The ship has set off to navigate the winds and the waters, but that's all been turned upside down. The wind and the waters are now navigating the ship, and the passengers can't do anything but watch and pray. They're at their wit's end. The place of the storm is in the deep waters where you've stepped out by faith. The producer of the storm is often God himself, and the peril of the storm, it leads you to the very end of your own rational ability. Now notice the prayer. I can promise you, if you're a Christian and you're in a storm, you pray. May not be a very a fundamental prayer, may not be a very polished prayer. Storms produce prayer. Unfortunately, prayer seems to be our last port in a storm. It should be our first. But the people of this passage do turn to God in verse 28. Here's what it says. And they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. Here's the thing I've noticed. Have you ever noticed this? Think about this carefully. The inverse relationship between the depth of a crisis and the length of a prayer. You could almost create a mathematical formula to demonstrate that the calmer things are, the longer and more eloquent are your prayers, but the greater the storm, the shorter and simpler are your prayers starting with this classic prayer adopted by many devout and troubled believers over the century. Here it is, help. <laughs> Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a place where all you had time for was help? The seafarers of this psalm may have called out the same words, and probably more than once. Their circumstances have certain similarities to the characters in the other paintings. Let's look at the first picture again. The desert wanderers hopelessly lost. Here's what it says about them. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. What about the prisoners? Remember them in their cell? What are they saying? Here's their verse. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. Meanwhile, back in the sterile, death-like hospital ward, what are the patients saying? And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. In the storms, in the wilderness, in the captivity, in the illnesses, people desperately seek an escape. And the only way out is the way up. No matter what the problem may be, no matter what the trouble may be, there is only one path to safety. The only hope is to reach beyond ourselves to someone stronger than we are, stronger than the shackles that bind us. And only one can fill that requirement. And even the proverbial atheist and the foxhole realizes if 
if he trusts God, that's his only hope. You know, the old adage is there aren't any atheists in foxholes because once they're there and they're, all of their other options are gone, God becomes their only hope. God certainly hates everything that causes us pain, whether it's imprisonment or illness or storms. But God knows that lesser pain is necessary to avoid deeper pain. It hurts to pull out a thorn, but the pain of leaving it would cause the deeper agony of infection. God knows that he has to pull out a few thorns occasionally, and will cry out in pain, and even angry will talk to God, but it's all for a purpose. God knows, even if we don't, that we're not self-sufficient. He loves to bring us to our knees in fresh dependence on him. Has he ever done that during these days? If only peacetime prayers carried the intensity of storm-tossed prayers. I remember as a young pastor, my wife became very ill one day, and we couldn't figure out what, it was, what was going on, and then she lost consciousness, and the ambulance came, and, and uh, we put her into the ambulance to take her to the hospital. This was back in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I crawled in with her in the back and kind of stretched out over her and, and prayed and prayed. And I pled with God uh, to, to not let anything happen to Donna. I don't think I've ever prayed such an intense prayer. That was my big storm. And ultimately, since she's sitting out here in this service, she made it. And we both made it. We never did know for sure what happened, but we know God heard our prayer. I remember thinking about the intensity of my prayer when that all took place and wondered, why can't I pray like that all the time? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever had a moment where you've cried out to God in intense prayer and maybe God has heard you and answered you? Well, we, we often don't pray like that unless we feel trapped and we feel desperate. So here we go. We're in the storm. We're in the midst of this thing, and God has heard our prayer. So let me tell you, let me just review where we are. The place of the storm, that's deep water. Who produces the storm? Almighty God. What is the peril of the storm? We go up and down, and we are at our wit's end. And what is the prayer in the storm? God help. And here's the peace in the storm. Here's where it should end. Psalm 107, verse 29 and 30, here's what it says. He calms the storm so that its waves are still, and they are glad because they are quiet. Have you ever noticed the wonderful purity of silence after a long cacophony of noise? The tyranny of sound suddenly loses its hold, and, and the un and the ensuing quiet seems to liberate your spirit. It's truly a peace that passes understanding. We refer to this phenomenon as the calm after the storm. It's not just in weather situations, but it happens in life. I'm sure that some people are hoping that all that's been happening in our country now is, is going to be pretty much settled and there will be a calm after the storm. It's about comfort and relief, and deep inside us we realize that the bringer of the storm is also the master of the storm, and he can take it away in a blink of a moment. When we realize he is great enough to send the storm and remove the storm, we fall down and we worship him. When the people of the psalm were being battered by the storm, they cried out in fear and helplessness, and God responded. He calmed the storm, he stilled the waves. Speaking of storms, Ron Mel told me about a woman who was caught in a frightening storm in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. She was aboard a luxury liner that was carrying a large number of children, and the women, the women saw that everyone was panicking, and obviously the panic was spreading to the kids, so, so they were running to and fro and all through the passages, and this was upsetting the children. So she gathered all the children together and began telling them Bible stories to keep them calm. And the children became quiet, captivated by the wonderful stories. The ship made it through, safe and sound, and the captain made his rounds, and he saw the woman laughing and talking with the children. She'd stayed calm through the storm, and she was calm now, and he was very puzzled. So he said, how'd you keep your cool when everyone else was falling in pieces? Have you been through this before? It's simple, said the woman. 
I have two daughters. One of them lives in New York and the other one lives in heaven. I knew I was going to see one or the other of them tonight. And it didn't make any difference to me which one. <laughs> Does that story seem a little trifle, maybe sentimental, and re- unrealistic? Well, it shouldn't. It simply describes the mindset of the serious believer, the follower who takes Jesus at his word. If you feel such a story is simply sentimental, you may feel the same way about heaven and the concept that God is in control. Grace through the storm is a function of believing that the creator of the storm is also the deliverer from it. He is also the one who can bring us peace and strength when all those around us are falling apart. He is our deliverer, and the fact is gloriously portrayed in living color in every canvas of the eternal gallery known as Psalm 107. The first painting shows desert wanderers, those who can't find the path. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. A city for a dwelling place, the very words that define hope and peace when you're lost in the desert. Then we revisit the darkened prison. What happens to the captives? Someone comes to unlock their cell and show them the sunlight again. Psalm 107, verse 14. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. And then over in the hospital, the patients are almost ready to die. Only they they get healed miraculously. Notice verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Downpour or desert, dungeon or disease, the specific facts of the crisis ultimately don't matter, for God is in control. And whatever we're doing and wherever we are, we may be up against everything that's so negative and difficult. But when we cry out to God in our trouble, he will hear us. He will calm the waters. And the time may come when he will even let us know the reasons he unleashed them on us. So we're almost finished, but one more review. The place of the storm, that's the deep waters where you're trusting God for great things. And the producer of the storm is often God himself. And the peril of the storm takes you to your wit's end. The prayer in the storm is God help us. And the peace in the storm is the calming of the waves and the calming of your heart. And let's notice the purpose of the storm. Verse 30, so he guides them to their desired haven. The Lord didn't stop delivering the people from the storm. He took them where they needed to go. There's only one twist. The storm may change our idea of a destination. Crises never leave us the same way as they find us. I hear people all the time asking this question. How are we going to be different after the coronavirus is over? How are we going to be different as people? How are we going to be different as families? How are we going to be different as churches? Those of us who love and trust God through the worst times, those of us who are receptive to what he might be trying to teach us, find that our hearts have been changed by the time the stillness replaces the storminess, and sometimes we don't know what to do with it. We will be far more in tune with his desires. When the storm is past, we will know that the one who delivered the storm also is the one who delivered us from the storm, and our goals will have moved closer to his. So you have the place of the storm, the producer of the storm, the peril of it, the prayer of it, the peace of it, the purpose of it. And here we are once again to worship. The praise after the storm. What is there for us in the time when the calm returns but to praise God? Have you ever been in a terrible situation where it looked like there was no way out and God miraculously moves in and shows you the way and not only shows you but carries you through and you're on the other side? And you're so full of 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 gladness and and praise. How we wish everyone we know and all the men and women on the face of the earth could come and join us in praising and exalting God. He's so much greater than any of the forces of nature. So we read in Psalm 107, verses 31 and 32, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. We've been hopelessly lost in the barren wilderness, and suddenly we find ourselves in an oasis. What do we do? We give thanks. Back to the first of the psalm, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, 
for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the hungry soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Or we've been imprisoned by addiction or abuse or past memories or another cruel master, and we discover a master who is loving and who frees us. And what do we do? Psalm 107, 15, and 16. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. In the first two word pictures in Psalm 107, we offer thanksgiving to the Lord for what he has done. But in the last two pictures, the image changes. We've been desperately ill, waiting only for death. How do we respond to healing? We come together for worship, verses 21 and 22. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. And finally, we make it through the storm. God brings us through, and what do we do? We assemble for thanksgiving, praise, and worship. Verses 31 and 32, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. This psalm is like the hymns we used to sing when I was growing up. I remember we used to have, uh, um, they called them song leaders back then. We would call them worship leaders now. And they would get up, and some of the old hymns had six verses. And, the, and I remember if I loved the hymn, that was all right. I don't mind. But if I didn't really care for the hymn and we had to sing it six times, that was another deal. But after every verse, there was a chorus. And you know how the hymns are. You, you sing the verse, and then the chorus is down at the bottom. It doesn't change. All the verses change, but the chorus remains the same. That's what happens in the psalm. After the desert experience, let men praise God. After the prison appearance experience, let men praise God. After being in the hospital and almost dying, what's the chorus? Let men praise God. And when you're in a storm and you come out of the storm, what do you do? <laughs> you praise God. Is it really important to include other people in your praising? The last two celebrations tell us we should. Shouldn't it be enough simply to thank God quietly in the prophecy and sincerity of your own heart? Well, we've had a good experiment with that right here in this building. Is it okay to praise God? Did we not have great worship and praise tonight? Yes, we did. It was amazing. But there was no choir, and there were no congregates except for a very few. The balcony is totally empty. All I see as I look further in this auditorium is darkness. What's missing in the praise of God at this moment are the people who do the praising. You say, well, I'm praising at home, but I can't hear you. And it's when we can hear each other, when we come together and worship. That's what we long for. That's what we're missing. That's why we can't wait to get back to church so that we can be with others who are believers and so we can blend our voices together and praise the Lord. I hear people say, and I've heard them say this, I don't really need to worship God in church. I can worship him just as well by myself, working in my garden on a Sunday morning or up at my lake cottage. Sounds convenient, but it's not very biblical. We are told all through the scripture to come together in the assembly for the exaltation of God together. So if you're sitting there listening to this message and making all your plans for a new, new moment in your worship of God and you've just decided you know, this is pretty cool. I got my coffee in my hands. I didn't have to get dressed up. I didn't have to get out on the highway. I didn't have to find a place to park. I'm worshiping God at home. You can do that, but you're out of the will of God. The will of God is for you to be with the people of God, worshiping together in the presence of the elders, it says. That's who we are. We're the, we're the teachers, the elders. You're supposed to come and worship God in our presence. That is the leaders and praise God. And when we do that together, we become something much greater than we could ever be by ourselves. Together, we offer an entirely different brand of worship than we offer when we're alone. Together, we are the living body of Christ. Oh, how I want to urge you, whether you're ready to do it immediately, don't lose your motivation to go. To, it doesn't have to be this church. Maybe you go to another church. Don't get yourself in a situation where you're going to be comfortable out of community. That is not the will of God for you. 
That's not David Jeremiah. I'm not begging you to come back because I want to see these seats full, although I do. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. So I'm looking for you. I'll be watching for you when the time comes for you to come back to church. I've been a pastor here at Shadow Mountain Community Church for almost four decades. But in the early years of my time here, I held two jobs. I was not only the pastor of the church, but I was the president of Christian Heritage College. I had a strong feeling of God's leading in holding both of these positions. But I never saw the storm front that was moving in. During one particular summer, the college had run out of resources. The tuition money was gone, and existing funds were insufficient to carry us through to the fall. The church had underwritten us, but now those resources were no longer available. The church had simply given all it could give, and nearly every week I went to meetings in which we agonized over what to do. Slowly but surely, we were edging toward the idea of simply closing the doors of the college. We even met with another Christian college to explore the possibility of a merger. And I remember wondering if this was what God had in mind, but I could feel no peace about it. One day I was filled with a sense of the storm raging around me. I felt like the waves were crashing over us and that we were drowning in the waves and I didn't know what to do. So I gathered our senior staff and we all traveled to a local Christian camp called Pine Valley Bible Camp. It was vacant. The caretakers allowed us to use one of their conference rooms. Our group gathered around a table to pray, but I still felt a deep sense of despair and hopelessness. No options. I mean, we had tried everything. We had used up every option we knew. Our prayers weren't being answered, or so it seemed. We had tried everything we could think of of trying. And I remember at that time coming to Psalm 107 and reading it to the group. It was the storm. My feeling of enduring a storm reminded me of the imagery in Psalm 107. So we sat there in the conference room at Pine Valley, and I opened my Bible, and I read this psalm that we have studied in this service. I told the senior staff, there is one crucial thing we can never forget. Together, we have chosen to do business in the great waters, in the deep waters. Not many churches have schools, but we have several We have a preschool and three elementary schools, a junior high school, a high school, and a college. We've pursued these out of obedience to God's leadership. It's not supposed to be easy. We've launched out into the deep, and we shouldn't be surprised to find ourselves caught in the storm. We talked about the challenge at hand, and I return to the theme of the psalm. I said, men, what we have to do is to cry out to the Lord. I remember telling them that when I had cancer, I had gone to the Brooklyn Tabernacle, and people came up to me in the Brooklyn Tabernacle and said to me, oh, Dr. Jeremiah, we cried out to the Lord for you. I'd never heard anybody use that term before. That was how they described the intensity of their prayer. That's what the psalmist says they did. They cried out to God. I said, men, we have to ask God to move in the midst of this situation and do something that only He can do. I've never experienced many events like the one I'm about to describe, and I'll never forget what happened. We began to pray around the table with very intense, heartfelt emotions and tears. It was one of those powerful, spiritually charged atmospheres that come about when needy Christians get serious about seeking for God's deliverance. Tears, pleading, and there was a knock at the door. It was the proprietor of the camp. Uh, she mentioned to me to come out into the hallway, and I got up from the prayer meeting and went out into the hallway, and she said to me, you need to call your office. Uh, I didn't have a phone, and there was a payphone on that campus, and I found the payphone and called my secretary at the church, and she said, are you sitting down? I said, no, I'm in a payphone booth. can't be sitting down. She says, well, if you can't sit down, hang on. And this is what she told me. She said that the women down in the college mail room had been routinely opening mail, and they came across a strange envelope. It contained no letter, no letter at all, but it did have a check in it, and the check was for a half a million dollars. I couldn't believe it. I know I should have because I had just asked God for it. 
I went back into the meeting with my eyes filled with tears and everyone was anxious. They wanted me to tell them who had died. They thought I had been called out because somebody in the church had died. I said, no one has died. Let me tell you what has happened. We've been sitting here in this room in the midst of a storm and we've been crying out to God for his help and he heard us and he reached out to us in our trouble and brought us into a place of peace. To say that we began to praise God would be an understatement. I'm glad you couldn't see what we did. When you come out of a storm in which all seems lost and God does something magnificent, the worship is unforgettable. That's known as a happy ending. And I wonder if you still have doubts that your story will have one. Perhaps the storm is raging for you as you read these words and listen to me tell my story. Perhaps you're lost in a wilderness of shattered hope or shut away in a prison of debt. Maybe you're facing a hospital ward of health concerns or family problems and you feel you'll be lost forever. Wherever you are, whatever the crisis may be, there is an important principle at work. Here it is. If you feel helpless, you have just become eligible for the assistance of God. You need only cry out for his salvation and he will do the rest and he will do it well. And when the storm is over, you'll be a new person, wiser, stronger, ready to serve him. The sea will be calm, the breeze will be soft, and the silence will present itself as a sanctuary for you to exalt his name and sing his glorious praises. If he can control the storm, what other wonderful works might he bring to pass in your life? With that exciting thought, you'll cast off and launch out into the deep waters and watch God go to work in your life. But you say, Dr. Jeremiah, I don't know God. I know about him. I hear you talking about him. I'm, I watch sometimes and hear you talk about God, but I don't know him. Well, that's where the journey begins. Let me tell you what I do know. You don't want to go into a storm without God. You just don't want to do that. Some of you are trying to negotiate that right now, and you would say a big amen if you could. So let me tell you how you can bring God, first of all, into your life and then be assured that wherever you end up, if it's in a storm, he's with you and he will never forsake you. The Bible says you come to God through Jesus Christ, his son. John tells us that there's no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So if you want to have God in your life, you have to accept Jesus Christ, his son, as your savior. And the son of God, Jesus Christ came into this world for you and for me, went to the cross of Calvary. There he paid the debt for all of our sin by his incredible death, infinite death in an infinite God. And because he paid the debt for our sin, we can be forgiven if we will just ask. So I'd like to lead you in a prayer at the end of this service whereby you can ask God to come into your life, Jesus Christ, to be your Savior. When you make that decision, it will change your life. You will look back on it as the most important thing you've ever done. And I want to encourage you to do it now. Dear God, in Australia, in Ireland, in Brazil, in Great Britain, in almost every state in the United States, there is gathered a congregation. Across the broad spectrum of this world, people are gathered as we worship. And there are some who have been brought into this moment so that they can encounter God through his son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as you have brought them to that place and they have this willingness to make this decision, help them with all of their hearts to seek your forgiveness and the hope that you bring. So here's what I want you to do. Just pray this prayer. Dear God, I need you in my life. I can't do the storm without you. I know and I believe that Jesus Christ is your son and that he came into this world to pay the penalty for my sin so that I could be forgiven and so that I could be saved and so that I could be born again and come to know Jesus as my own Savior and Lord. So Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. Give me the gift of eternal life, which you promised to all who will ask you. 
Help me to live for you from this moment on. Help me to find those who, who believe in you and grow with them in community, in a church, in a Bible study. Lord, I thank you for caring so much about me that you would give your life in my behalf. James and Jill uh, Steddeford were working in Asia when James began feeling ill. His condition deteriorated, and during the night, he was, he was so sick, Jill was jolted awake by a heavy thud. James had fallen out of bed, and he was writhing on the floor, gasping for breath. He was showing signs of viral meningitis. Please, God, she prayed, don't let him die. And she ran for neighbors, and they managed to get him into a makeshift stretcher, into a boat, and across the river, and into a waiting ambulance. And day after day passed, and James grew worse. His fever and his suffering increased, and one long day passed after another. Each moment was prolonged agony for Jill. Her emotions flew across the gamut. She was in a foreign hospital with an apparently dying husband, and she wanted to know how long before he turned the corner and started to improve, or if he would. You know, it's hard to be in an extended crisis, isn't it? We know that now after 14 weeks of what we've been experiencing. One long day after the next is filled with moments of stress and anxiety and anger and sadness and hope sometimes hopelessness. It's a toxic brew of bubbling emotions that eat us alive from the inside out. But I'm glad to tell you that James did turn the corner, and he was able to return to England for a full recovery, but it was an event the family will never forget. Later, James and Jill wrote their story for a book, and the book is called When the Roof Caves In, and their section of the book is Where is God When It Hurts? And their final answer was, he's with us when it hurts, too. And sometime in every life, in your life and in mine, we find ourselves in a dark tunnel where no light seems visible. You weep and you cry, you're frustrated and you plead, Lord, I can't take it anymore. I have no more patience and no more strength to hold out. I've got to hear from you today. Most of us have been there. What about you? It may have been because of a long, drawn-out sickness. It might have been because of a long-term financial problem. Maybe you've had a struggle with grief, or maybe you've been an alcoholic spouse or an unsaved loved one, or dysfunction is going on in your family. Or perhaps you're suffering through a problem at work, a demanding, unreasonable boss, or a jealous, spiteful fellow worker whom you have to cope with every single day with no resolution in sight. And before you know it, you find yourself in David's shoes, and you can understand his heartfelt words and emotions. This man is a hero. He's a man of God, the favorite son and sweet singer of Israel. David is a man after God's own heart, and yet he's a man of anguish and suffering. He's a man given to the depths of depression, and he cries out to God with these words, How long? Let me fill in some of the background. David's boyhood had been one of a shepherd boy, just one of several sons in a large family. Well, what a fateful turn of life had taken. From the moment David killed the giant Goliath, he himself became a hunted man. One moment he was the toast of the nation, and the next he was a young man hiding out in caves. The king, the insecure and temperamental Saul, was bitterly jealous. You see, Saul's stock had plummeted as that of the shepherd boy had skyrocketed. The women of Israel celebrated the victory of David over Goliath by singing a song that is recorded for us in 1 Samuel 18, 7. Here's the song. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. That was an intolerable situation for an egotistical monarch, and Saul began to eye David from that day forward. You see, we often forget that David was a fugitive for eight or nine years. We forget that he lived a life on the run in the very country where he was a national hero. Furthermore, his life and his plight were complicated by all kinds of personal entanglements. Get this, Saul, David's enemy, the same ruthless king, 
whose life was dedicated to hunting David down and murdering him, Saul was also the father of a son who was David's best friend and a daughter who had stolen David's heart. Can you imagine a more complicated personal scenario than that? There was a time when David had the protection of 600 of his faithful men. He settled in a place called Ziklag, where he managed to live peaceably for 16 months. But one day, he left on a military mission, and when he returned home, the city of Ziklag had been burned to the ground. All the wives and the children whom the soldier had left behind were carried away, including David's own family. David's men were not merely grief-stricken. They were filled with fury, and they turned their anger on David, and they threatened to stone him to death. It was all David's fault. That's the way they saw it. As far as they were concerned, David, their leader, had cost them their wives and their children. 1 Samuel 30 tells of David's deep distress. He'd lost his own family. He was blamed for the loss of hundreds of other women and children. And now he faced death by stoning. Out of his pain, in his heart, he cried out to the Lord. And out of that furnace of his desperation came the incredible words of Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am removed. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. David wrote this psalm when he was physically exhausted. He was emotionally depressed. His troubles with King Saul had gone on year after year, and he was discouraged. And this psalm was wrung out of the extremity of his soul. He simply could not go on. As we examine this psalm, we learn some things about ourselves from David. First of all, we discovered that our struggle happens when God delays. On those occasions when you struggle with God's timing, it's good to know these feelings didn't originate with you. Not only did David express the feelings you've had, he did so repeatedly. If you read through the Psalms, you'll find a number of Psalms like the one we're exploring in this message. Just as a song has a refrain, this Psalm has one a recurring phrase that always comes back around. This time the chorus or refrain is repeated four times. Here it is. How long? Aren't you grateful for the Psalms that are such remarkable illustrations of honest prayer? I mean, I don't always pray with total honesty. You, you may not either. You force a smile into your prayers and you say, I couldn't be better, Lord. But God knows what you're going through, and he has been looking forward to talking it over with you, and he'd be much happier with an exasperated how long than with your forced smile. When God delays, sometimes we feel forgotten. Psalm 13, 1 says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Forever? You come to a point sometimes of believing that God has forgotten you. Don't worry. It's a common experience. We all go through it one time or another, feeling that God isn't there, or at the very least, he's forgotten us. Perhaps our problems aren't important to him, we imagine. The psalmist encounters those very doubts in Psalm chapter 10 and verse 1. Here's what he says there. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? You see, everyone has a point somewhere in the geography of their souls marking the limits of their faith. It is the point at which faith begins to unravel. Only we ourselves know where the point lies, and we find out during a season of testing. A trial will build to a crescendo in your life. You attempt to handle it, and you pray about it, but life will not cooperate. And as the days turn to weeks, and then weeks to months, and months even to years, you reach that personal point somewhere in the scheme of your suffering when you begin to give up on God. 
What you believe is that he has given up on you. You may even be feeling that way right now as you watch this message. If so, please allow me to remind you that what you're contemplating is a simple impossibility. God never gives up on you. He never ceases to care about you, and he will not abandon his work on you, of which your trial is a part. I love the poignant words in Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16. Listen to these words. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, but I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. God wants us to realize that even if that woman could somehow forget the precious child at her breast, he would never forget you. He even says that your name is written on the palms of his hands. Your very name is tattooed on the palms of God's hands. It is engraved there. It cannot be removed. And such is God's concern for you. He cannot forget you. No matter what storm you're weathering now, you have never left God's mind or his heart. Yes, sometimes when God delays, we feel forgotten. But it can even get worse. Sometimes when God delays, we feel forsaken. Read on in Psalm 13, verse 1. How long will you hide your face from me? We can feel the frustration and despair in David's words. It seems as if God has forgotten him. Yes, even worse, it feels as if God has purposely averted his eyes from David so as not to be bothered by the troubles of his suffering child. Perhaps he knows better, but David feels as if God simply doesn't care. David feels forsaken. Now, forgotten is one thing, but forsaken is another matter entirely. We very innocently forget people, people we love and care about. That can happen in the hectic pace of life. But the act of forsaking is very intentional, premeditated forgetfulness. And that is how David feels. That is how you have felt. My God, why have you forsaken me? You might recognize those words. Jesus said them in his anguish on the cross. Do you know where Jesus got those words? He pulled them from Psalm 22. If you study that psalm, you'll find the same man, David, has repeatedly said those words. Psalm 22, 1 and 2, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groanings? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. It's helpful to know that David suffered and felt forsaken. But it's life-changing to realize that even Jesus himself, the Lord of heaven and earth, enclosed in flesh, experienced the same emotions. Imagine the Lord Jesus Christ not only felt forsaken, he was forsaken. God turned his back on Jesus because he was a holy and just God who could not look upon the sin that Jesus carried to the cross, your sin and my sin. The next time you feel forsaken, lift up your voice to pray to Almighty God. Do this. Go to a private place and spend significant time reflecting on the incredible truth that the one who hears your prayers has been there too. He knows exactly how you feel. He knows what it means to be forsaken. And here is the truth you must fully comprehend and stake your life upon if you remember no other words from this message. Jesus hung upon the cross, and God turned his back upon his son so that he would never have to turn his back on you. That was the excruciating price he paid because he loves you that much. He loved and died and suffered on this earth so you wouldn't have to be forsaken. So when God delays answering us, we sometimes feel forgotten. Sometimes we even feel forsaken. But when God delays, we often feel frustrated. Have you felt frustrated with God lately? I mean, if we're honest, we've all had times when we've said, or at least felt like saying, God, I'm really upset. I've been praying about this for years, for months, and it doesn't seem as if you're there. Listen to the words of the psalmist in the second verse of Psalm 13. 
How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Now, let me help you understand what's going on here. David is frustrated for two reasons. He's frustrated, first of all, because of his own emotions. He says in the psalm, every day I go through this. Every day I have to deal with this. Someone said that the problem with life is that it's so daily. Each morning we rise and face our challenges, and the same ones are there every day, rain or shine, summer, winter, spring or fall. Whatever we have to deal with when we get up and reboot our minds, all the same crisis take up right where they left off. The problem begins to take over in our lives. Have you ever experienced the frustration of something painful or negative or sad becoming your constant and daily companion? Of course you know what to do. You've been taught to read your Bible and pray and spend time with God's people, but you're no longer dealing with a problem. The problem is now dealing with you. And it has taken over, and it's got you into such an emotional bind that no matter how hard you try, you know you can't do the thing you should do. This is what happened to David. He was frustrated by his emotions. And number two, he was frustrated because of his enemy. David cried out in verse 2, How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Now remember, David was the king in waiting. He had been anointed by Samuel as the king of Israel back in his days as a shepherd. Listen to me. Do you know how much time passed between David's anointing and the moment he actually became king? Fifteen long years. David became the enemy of Saul. Saul was jealous of David. He wanted to kill him. And David spent most of those 15 years running from Saul, hiding out in caves. What was the meaning of all this? David shook his fist at the sky above him, and he said, How long, Lord, is my enemy going to be exalted over me? Whose side are you on, God? And if the answer was David's, you could have fooled the young man. God seemed to give Saul everything, and David got nothing. Isn't it a comfort to know David had the kind of black days we do? Aren't you glad the psalm doesn't stop there? David may have thought he didn't have a prayer, but in fact, he was just where God wanted him to be. We've noticed our struggle when God delays. What about our supplication when God delays? What about our prayer? Let's talk about the foundation of it. David repeats one little word, one little phrase, three times in his prayer of desperation. Here's the word, lest. L-E-S-T. You can put a circle around that in your Bible because it's a key to David's thoughts. This is the kind of small, inconspicuous word on which the entire meaning of a Scripture passage can hinge. Lest is a conditional word. First David says, lest I sleep the sleep of death. God, hear me. How long before you hear me? Lord, hear me, lest I sleep the sleep of death. David was so worn out physically and emotionally that he fully expected to die. He seemed to have come to the last page, and since the book of his life story was about to close, it seemed like an appropriate time to pray. Not only did he fear his own death, he also feared his own defeat. He said in verse 4, lest, there's that word, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. There's the word lest again. David is certain that Saul will come out the winner. David knows he has been anointed king. He knows God has put him in this place, and he's preparing to surrender as a prisoner. And it seems like an appropriate time to pray. Perhaps worst of all, David feared his own disgrace. Notice verse 4. Here's the word lest again. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. You see, everyone in Israel knew that David was being pursued by Saul. When the enemy caught him, David would be humiliated, a subject of mockery. And the terrible thought of that for one who has been promised a kingdom made it seem like an appropriate time to pray. David prayed in Psalm 13 because he was desperate. Through the years, I've often observed how God steers us into that emotional cul-de-sac he likes to corral us into a corner where the only way out is the way up. We have nowhere else to turn, and that's when we get serious about praying. So if you're going through a time of trouble right now, as so many of us are, don't rail against God for what He has done to bring you to this place. 
Instead, ask him how you can learn to be his trusting child, how you can hang on to the desperation that brings about sincere, heartfelt prayer. When we become desperate, we cry out, Oh, Lord, help me. And he always does. Foundation for our prayer. Notice the form of the prayer. Verse 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Enlighten my eyes. In his desperation, David prayed three prayers in verse 3. First, he said, Lord, consider me. The words actually mean, Lord, look on me. Look at me. What he wanted to say was, Lord, don't turn your back on me anymore. Turn around and look at me and see me. His second prayer is, Lord, hear me. David is pleading with God to answer his questions. Lord, please hear what I'm saying. And then there's this very curious third request. He says, Lord, enlighten my eyes. Now, when I first read that, my interpretation was that David was saying, Lord, show me what you're doing. Enlighten me, giving me insight. But that's not the meaning of the phrase at all. Here's what it means. David was saying, Lord, put the light back in my eyes. Isn't that a curious thing to put in our prayers? Put the light back in my eyes. You can easily spot a person who's suffering through depression. His face gives him away. Depression transforms one's countenance into a mask, empty and rigid. Most of all, the light in the person's eyes has been extinguished. That's where David is, and he prays, Oh Lord, I have no hope. Please see me, please hear me, and oh God, put the light back in my eyes. What a moving prayer this is. The foundation and the form, and notice the focus. He prays to the Godhead, two persons in the Godhead. Consider and hear me, he says in verse 3. O Lord Jehovah, my God Elohim, enlighten my eyes. Jehovah reflects God's promises. Elohim reflects God's power. So David is saying, O God of power and promise, I appeal to you. In this moment of transformation, I believe David's mind must have gone back to the promise that was given him, the promise that he would be the king. I believe he had a resurgence of faith that he would sit on Israel's throne. God had promised him something despite all that had transpired, and that meant something. Had to. He suddenly realized, David's heart suddenly realized and returned to the conviction that the God who promises is the God who is powerful, who can stand behind his promises. David's faith rebounds and reasserts itself. I often think of Jeremiah 2011 when I'm feeling difficulty, even borderline depression. Here's what it says. The Lord is with me as a mighty awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. And there's a similar promise in Psalm 138, verses 7 and 8. Here's what it says. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. We find tremendous hope of victory in the midst of the deepest pits of life. But it's no simple process. There isn't a handy guaranteed formula for hope in the midst of suffering. It takes absolute fall-on-your-face humility and genuine gut-wrenching honest prayer. We must come to the point where we hear ourselves saying, Lord God, my life is devastated. I've been victimized by my emotions and overwhelmed by my problems. Life has thrown all it can at me, and I've caved in. I've experienced none of the victory. I haven't honored you. I am at the point of surrender. But, oh, Lord God, in the midst of all of this, help me to see and to know my mighty, awesome one, Jehovah Elohim. Our strength when God delays, <clears throat> our supplication when God delays, and now the end of the psalm, Psalm 13, our song, When God Delays. I've told you during this series that most of David's psalms start with a sigh and end with a psalm. 
You see his trouble in full color. He's not bashful about letting it all out. But if you hang in there with him to the end, he gets back to the right place. And there's a threefold progression in this psalm, moving from tears to triumph. Right in the center lies the ultimate truth that makes the difference. The truth is that Jehovah Elohim, Almighty God, is in charge. No wonder David breaks in to joyful song. First of all, our song is a song of triumph. David writes in verses 5 and 6, But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. David's song is a song of triumph. And how did he reach that point? He began to see God. Our troubles can cause us to avoid the places where we're most likely to see God. Have you ever noticed that? I'm always puzzled when troubled people fall away from the church. They may be strong pillars of the local fellowship, but when trouble comes along, they disappear. Somebody says, have you ever noticed that? What happened to old Joe? Or we missed you in church. Well, the truth is they say, we're having trouble in our marriage. If that's true, you should get up early and go to both services. You need all the church you can get when you're in a time like that. Our faith isn't a luxury intended for periods of smooth sailing. Neither is our fellowship. When trouble comes along, that's when it's wonderful to be a part of a faithful, Bible-believing body of people who will rally around you and help you. They'll pray for you and support you with their resources, and they'll encourage you and counsel you in the tough decisions. The devil is the only one whose opinion is that you should take a sabbatical from church during hard times. David says, I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. What does that word salvation mean to you? I hope you realize that it's more than just being saved from sin. It can also be about salvation from predicaments that occur in the here and now. God saves us in the big picture, but the Bible assures us that he saves us also in the small ones too when we ask him. You might question that conclusion because you think about poor, beleaguered David. How exactly has God saved him in this situation? Saul is still coming after him. The armies are still on the march. Things look as hopeless as ever. On the face of things, what really has changed? Nothing except David's memory. He has recalled as the spirit of prayer took hold of him and God counseled his hurting soul that nothing has changed about God. He has recalled that his Lord is changeless. He's been mighty in the past, and that has not changed. He's been loving and full of blessing, and that has not changed. He's had a plan for David, and that has not changed either. David has remembered these things, and he begins to sing with joy in words that simultaneously reflect past promises and future fulfillment. God, you have delivered me. Our song is a song of triumph, and it's also a song of thanksgiving. David writes in verse 6, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Friends, if you want to stay healthy as a Christian, you need to go back and remember what God has done for you in the past. I think I told you a couple weeks ago of a woman who wrote to me who watched our online service, and she said she had heard me talk about how important it was to remember what God had done. And she said, I went back. I took a pen and a card, and I wrote down what I thought were the top 10 things God has done for me in my life. And she said, when I did that, and I began to read those things, I realized what a rich and blessed person I am. The devil wants to minimize everything that God has done for you and maximize all of the problems you have. Don't let him do that to you. When you feel least like it, you need to remember God's goodness. I wrote in my Bible one day, don't forget to polish your monuments. <laughs> Don't forget to polish the monuments of victory in your life. That's the most wonderful reason for keeping a journal. David consults the journal in his mind, in his dealings with the Lord, and he realizes God has dealt bountifully with me. We know from the Psalms that David called upon his memory often to nurture and refresh his faith. When anxiety for the future built up, as it did from time to time, even after this time in his life, David faced it with the testimony of the past. His life may not have been what he might have chosen, but it was a life that could never have lasted this long without God's intervention. 